for okay now now we're being recorded okay so um thanks for joining everyone uh in uh broadcasting live from the uh western end of the upper peninsula so i hope technology cooperates um so just uh, to get started though um you know we are in a truly extraordinary time uh you know with this pandemic that is upon us and as sort of a backdrop for that, I just want you to know that, you know, there's been a lot of folks in public health and in public health registries, uh, immunization information systems, the other name for them, uh, who have been really preparing for this sort of response for a long, long time. And I, and I hope to point out how that is exactly uh, the case uh, in, in my talk this morning. So I'm gonna start out by saying, okay, let's, let's talk a little bit about what immunization information systems are. Um, and then get down to the meat of the matter, um, how they can support local and statewide uh, response to a uh, pandemic, as well as looking at uh, what sort of systems might be in place or being put in place to support a national response. So let's get right down to it. Um, if you were the textbook version of um, the uh, definition for an immunization information system. Um, they're uh, typically referred to as confidential, my emphasis here, population-based uh, computerized databases that record all immunization doses gathered by uh, any immunization provider uh, to persons living in a particular geopolitical area. And my little schematic view of that is this. So key thing, population-based and it's comprehensive. All of the different immunization providers in this jurisdiction will report to the registry. So in my little schematic here, uh, the immunization information system is the hub and the spokes might be, let's say Michigan Medicine or, or St. Joe's, uh, public health agencies, schools, universities, uh, retail pharmacies like Walgreens, CVS and the like, and then private uh, practices, you know, ABC pediatrics or wherever it might be. All of them report into the centralized uh, immunization registry to share the, the information. And so what we have then is one unified record of all providers, all doses. And that's a big deal because if you think about it, if you go to your own, um, let's say we go to Epic uh, and we have the uh, University of Michigan system, what you have typically there are going to be the doses that were administered by the University of Michigan. And so you have that view locally, but the registry is really that population based view. So we have this record of all doses that are administered, but an important point I wanna share with you folks this morning is there's a lot more in that registry other than just the doses. Um, when a, um, a child or a person is uh, um, uh, offered a uh, particular vaccine and they refuse, that refusal can be uh, uh, also documented as a non-administration is what we call it. Uh, we can also document immunity. Let's say a child has chicken pox and, and is no longer in need of uh, the varicella vaccine, for example. We also track waivers for school attendance. Uh, you, you're probably aware that schools require certain vaccines for attendance and uh, at times parents may need or wish to get a waiver and those waivers are issued and uh, tracked at the um, uh, individual level at, actually at the dose level um, for, for individuals. So these are population-based systems. Um, we have all kids uh, linked to uh, a birth certificate. Uh, the, these immunization information systems as children are born uh, they are fed by these registry systems to make sure that that denominator, the population, is as complete as possible. Another important function of immunization registries are the, um, the vaccine inventory management. And some of you uh, may know that you know, this is actually really complex stuff. And it's, uh, it's actually uh, a challenge. Well, these immunization registries are well suited to that. And they, they track vaccine inventory from a couple of perspectives. From the practice perspective, so let's say in my pediatric practice at ABC Pediatrics, I can keep track, <clears throat> excuse me, of my doses. But we can also, depending on your authorization, let's say you're the Washtenaw County Health Department, you can actually look at all of the doses available uh, for a certain vaccine across your jurisdiction, Washtenaw County. Um, the doses are tracked in two key different ways. Uh, we have doses that are purchased by the federal government under the Vaccines for Children, BFC program. Those are in their own sort of inventory. 
and then the private stock, the, the doses that will be used for persons with private insurance or cash payments, those are in a different uh, stock. Those are separated uh, in the uh, immunization information systems. Um, the products themselves, you'll see here my uh, little picture, you know, I don't know if uh, some of you have seen this or noticed this, but uh, the actual vaccine products have uh, uh, two-dimensional barcodes on them that encode things like the uh, product name, the lot number, the expiration date. Um, that is able to be, we are able to then use barcoders to uh, actually track our vaccine inventory as it moves through uh, the workflow, okay? Another important feature of immunization information systems is decision support. And I'll tell you why this is really uh, important. Um, you may know that if you have a specific individual, let's say a patient uh, presenting to themselves, um, take that individual's uh, date of birth. If you have their history, their vaccination history, you can evaluate their eligibility for vaccines at that point in time based on national recommendations. So you would know whether or not they are up to date or not, and whether or not they in fact are eligible or coming due soon, uh, a forecast uh, for uh, eligibility coming uh, due soon. Now, I wanted to share with you a little tiny bit of history here. Let's go back 30 years or so. Um, that ability to determine what a person is due for at that moment in time used to be really simple. So for kids, uh, this is the uh, primary vaccination series going back to the 80s, late 80s. And quite honestly, providers could do this mostly off the top of their head or they might refer to their little cheat sheet on a card in their uh, lab coat pocket. But this is pretty simple stuff. Decision support was basically, look, the kid's two months old, they're getting polio, they're getting DTP, and that's what they got. It was basically very simple, no need for any other uh, assistance really. Well, most times done out of the providers uh, right out of their own head. So um, it's no longer that way. You may have seen this before. This is the CDC uh, published uh, child and adolescent immunization schedule, which has been um, approved by the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, otherwise known as ACIP. I don't expect you to read this at all. It's not necessarily what, uh, what I want you to know is we've got a lot of vaccines in this list. We have 15 of them listed. And we have a really complex schedule, sort of this, you know, this fruit salad of different uh, um, uh, timings and different doses and whatnot. And it's complex as is, but um, help, heaven help us if we get off of that schedule. And let's say the kid, uh, the child is sick and can't get certain dose, or perhaps the parent opts to sort of stretch out that vaccination schedule because they don't want kids getting all these doses at one time. Things get really, really complicated. Immunization information systems can handle that. They understand the schedule and all the variations of it, and they can still evaluate that complex situation in these decision support engines. So that's a very important function of uh, these registries. Just a quick word on the Michigan registry, something I've worked with actually since before uh, it was even born, uh, back when it was a little embryo. Um, the Michigan Care Improvement Registry, MICR as it's known, began uh, its actual operations in uh, 1996. And again, this is one of these birth-based registries where all births uh, are added directly and immediately into the uh, registry right from our state's uh, vital record birth registration system. Um, all immunizations providers are required by state law to report all doses administered to children uh, under 21 years of age. So the law says you got to report, uh, report. Now, what's interesting, public health code also says that the registry is authorized to accept doses for persons 21 and older. So that makes our registry a life course registry. Uh, it's mandatory for kids, but it's authorized for adults. And that's a big deal, especially as we go through our talk today and are looking at pandemic response about the public health law in Michigan. All right, so a few fun facts. So in Michigan, we have roughly 300 babies born a day. So those within usually a week, sometimes it takes a little while for births to be certified as a lot of you are aware. Uh, babies sometimes even leave the hospital without a name, you know, and so it takes a little while for those um, uh, details to be added and for, uh, having a birth certificate formally uh, registered and certified. But within a week or so, you know, hello world, those babies are in uh, the registry and oftentimes they carry with them 
uh, their hepatitis B dose that might have been administered on day two of, the, of their life. So that comes right into the registry with the birth certificate. So we have that denominator being built as those babies are being born. Uh, it translates into roughly about 16,000 doses being added to the registry each and every day. In total, over the years, we have something like 10 million people included in the NICA registry with over 150 million total doses accumulated. And of course, each and every day, more and more uh, thousands of those doses are being entered. Just want to share with you a couple images of the NICA registry. Again, sort of a historical fun fact. Back in the day, uh, you know, let's go back to the 90s, uh, you may or maybe not, not know, you know, there were no electronic medical records. Those did not really exist, except in extremely rare instances, some institutions had them, hospital-based institutions. So really immunization registries were the only game in town in terms of, of um, you know, office automation for medical practices, certainly to track vaccinations. Um, and here we see the, this is actually the current uh, web version of, of Maker, where you've got the series, vaccine series listed in the rows, and the columns are all the different doses that were administered to this uh, child uh, as they progress through the schedule and the specific product that was uh, administered. And then also there's a sort of a call out there saying what is uh, up to date, what's overdue, or what's complete. So at a glance, a person can understand for this particular uh, person, in this case, it's a child, uh, what they are due for. So the MICA registry has those types of views, and which again, was the only way to really uh, um, understand uh, child to date or not from an automated perspective um, in the, that era before electronic health records. A historical view, uh, which is, this is a chronological view, all sorts of different views. One of them, this is an excerpt from something called the Michigan Official uh, Vaccination Record, which the reason I put this up here is it's actually the same information that you just saw, you know, basically the vaccine series uh, here on the rows and the, the different doses that have been administered. But this is oftentimes printed in clinic uh, by practices what they'll do is they'll queue up, let's say, our appointments for tomorrow. All those children, a uh, medical assistant or nurse or administrator may pull up each of those MICR records, print them off, circle what the child is due for. And actually, this uh, paper uh, oftentimes follows that child through the workflow as they come in for their appointment the next day and providers record things. And then they'll use this as sort of a kind of a working sheet as to what was uh, actually uh, offered to the child what was uh, administered and if anything was refused or, or wasted or any of that kind of stuff. And so it's sort of a paper trail uh, in clinic, which is commonly used uh, to this day, even though, of course, this information is all automated. So that's sort of the 101 of what uh, immunization registries do and a little sneak peek into how like MICR operates. But what I want to do is, is sort of switch gears and talk a little bit about how that functionality can be applied at the local level and at a statewide level uh, in terms of some uh, uh, pandemic response, okay? So if you take that functionality, clearly as a person comes in, let's say, okay, we're in the middle of this COVID uh, 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 pandemic right now, uh, I walk into my primary care uh, clinic, they can use this information uh, you know, in real time to assess whether an individual, me, uh, is up to date or not for my COVID vaccine. Um, so the, at an individual level, systems are, are very well suited for that sort of thing. But these systems also allow um, uh, reminders uh, for sort of preemptive uh, notifications. You are coming due for something. That's certainly uh, true for COVID vaccine, where we might have uh, a two dose series and I could get a reminder saying, hey, you know, uh, you're in, you know, 10 days, you need to get your second dose of COVID vaccine. Those kinds of reminders uh, or recall when you're overdue, uh, you can get notifications sent out by the registry as well. Um, but uh, unique to registries, of course, are this jurisdiction level vaccination uh, view where we can sort of go up at a, a population level and say, hey, look, for all of Washtenaw County or all of you know Marquette County or wherever, um, here are our COVID vaccination coverage rates for this particular county. And uh, you may be able to reveal certain areas that, uh, as we call them, are pockets of need to do outreach using reminders. Um, as I had mentioned, uh, these immunization registries have sophisticated inventory management and, and tracking systems. And so you, as a public health official, may need to redistribute uh, 
vaccine product from one practice in one end of the county to another, or as, as uh, happens, sometimes there's short dated vaccine that's about to expire. Sometimes they move that around to that basically ensure that it doesn't expire while it's waiting to be administered and they move it to a different practice uh, to make sure to do well. So the immunization registries support each of those functions quite um, easily. But going back to my sort of schematic, remember I'm saying, as we meet the challenges of this pandemic, we are connecting all these different immunization providers, these stakeholders, whether they be health systems like uh, the Michigan Medicine or St. Joe's or public health agencies, health plans, Blue Cross Blue Shields, consumers, you and I, all of those uh, stakeholders need to be connected to this uh, registry in some fashion to effectively uh, respond to the pandemic. And if you think about it, uh, let's look at it from the provider perspective. There's this enormous diversity of electronic health record systems out there. We at Michigan Medicine use the EPIC system, but there are many, many different uh, EHRs being used across the, the state, dozens in fact. And so these immunization uh, information systems need to be able to speak in real time to this diverse selection of EHRs and not only allow us to push information up to the registry, remember we have to report in Michigan by law, all those kid doses have to go up to the registry, uh, but also likewise, we need to be able to pull that information down so that we can actually have that consolidated record at the point of service. In your office, when you're seeing your patients um, in primary care, we wanna know at that point in time, uh, is this child due or not due using complete and accurate information? That sort of exchange, that bi-directional exchange that some of you have heard me talk a lot about in real time is uh, actually uh, crucial and it hinges on something that I've underlined here for emphasis, one of my favorite topics in health informatics, standards. It all hinges on the use of standards. I'm gonna take a little uh, excursion here for a couple of slides to talk about standards, but before I do, um, I just want to remind you in sort of the days before standards and office automation, you know, this is what uh, practices looked like. And, uh, you know, this is not 100 years ago. Uh, actually, I took this picture, uh, I think, in 2010, uh, just as electronic health records were just in their infancy in, in the state of Michigan. But you can very clearly see how we tracked vaccinations and really everything else in the patient record. Here they are, neatly uh, organized in paper folders. This is the way it was. That's the only thing we had, and the only office automation we had at the time, because electronic health records were essentially non-existent, uh, not just in Michigan, but just nationally, uh, they just didn't exist. Our office automation was uh, immunization registries and the fax machine. So if we were doing exchange, it was invariably by fax. That's what we had. So that's the world we lived in in 2010. Well, since then, uh, we've adopted standards uh, slowly but surely throughout the industry. And the only way the exchanges that I'm talking about can actually be accomplished is through this uh, use of standards, such as procedure codes, uh, diagnosis codes that most of you are at least familiar with. Lab results are encoded by something called LOINC code. And even when we have things like um, non-numeric data, like uh, uh, narrative data, uh, there's uh, uh, nomenclature uh, uh, vocabularies, SNOMED that are used to capture that. And whatever that uh, information is that's been encoded in those ways, those data content st uh, standards, the key for the exchange that I'm talking about today is the last bullets, uh, which are data format standards. Think of that as being sort of the electronic envelope that we send this information along in. And so I'm, I boiled down actually an hour long lecture into two bullets here, which is what you need to take away is that data format standard that's, that's important here today about immunization information system, HL7. Health level seven is a message format that in, uh, very, very nicely supports this bi-directional exchange, pushing uh, immunization records up, pulling them down from the registry. It's, it's made for that. And, it is widely adopted throughout uh, healthcare IT. This is not a simply a standard that has been adopted by immunization registries or electronic health record systems. 
this is not just a national standard. This is a global standard. This has been around since the mid 80s, actually before even immunization registry and uh, is very, very well established and used widely. So this is crucial to the kind of exchanges that we need. So back to my little schematic, when we look at the, the hub here, that immunization information system, those uh, uh, vaccination providers, whether it be health systems or health departments or private practices, are not only pushing information up to the registry or pulling it down using those HL7 messages, which have been um, uh, enabled in the registry and their electronic health record system. So how did that come about? Did everybody just wake up one morning and just decide, hey, we're gonna do HL7 from now on? Well, actually, Going back to the era where I showed you that photograph from that uh, pediatric practice, in 2009, when I was going out to those practices for another CDC funded uh, study, there were no electronic health records, none, zero, there was none. Uh, actually, there was one uh, family medicine practice uh, that had a brand new system that they were uh, incorporating, but this was, it was so unique, okay? Well, something came along called the High Tech Act. And if you remember the economic downturn of 2008-9 in that era, well, we had this giant stimulus act where billions and billions of dollars were sent out. One of the uh, conduits for that uh, stimulus money was under the High Tech Act of 2009, which provided many billions of dollars of incentive payments to get automation out there. What did that mean? We're going to incentivize health systems like the University of Michigan to get uh, EHR systems. We're going to incentivize private practices to adopt them. And so as a consequence, the electronic health record vendors, such as Epic, Cerner, and all the big ones, actually all of them, have widely adopted HL7 standards because they really couldn't be in business without it. Because that High Tech Act basically says, you can get this money for buying an electronic health record system. And oh, by the way, you can get even more money if you connect with a public health registry. Like, oh, really? And so if you connect with, let's say, an immunization registry, you would be eligible for a greater payment. Well, it worked. Practices adopted interoperability due to those incentives. And this real-time reporting that we're seeing now today is timely and complete, <clears throat> excuse me, because of those standards being adopted by the vendors. And of course, by practices buying those EHR products, which, as I said, in 2009, largely did not exist. So. As a result of this sort of widespread um, adoption uh, of, uh, of uh, HL7 uh, messaging through electronic health records and those connections to immunization registries, we have what I refer to, this is my terminology of the interoperability dividend. By that, I mean, these are benefits that are realized by basically removing barriers. We make it really, really easy for people to report. And as a consequence, it has uh, data quality uh, implications in a good way. We have more timely, complete, and accurate information. If you humor me for the next four slides, I'm going to show you exactly that uh, how that worked in Michigan. This is this is the uh, interoperability dividend. So let me orient you to this slide. First slide here is for children doses, kids uh, in this case uh, 18 and under, reported to the MICA registry between 2010, and that's on the uh, x-axis here on the the uh, uh, lower uh, axis here, you'll see between 2010, 2019. Uh, if you can read those numbers, uh, it's around 5 million-ish. Uh, and you can see here, this is hovering right around 5 million steady over each of those 10 years, okay? So not surprising that we have steady uh, reporting because guess what? It's the law. In Michigan, you have to report. But here's the interesting part. So what I've overlaid here are stack bars that show for each of those, let's say 5 million-ish doses that were reported to MICR in each of these years. Let's go back to 2010 here on the far left. And so what this says is that it's a stack bar, stacks it 100%, obviously. The hashed part says, you know what? 75% of those doses at that time were entered by good old-fashioned keyboard. Somebody stood there and entered these by keyboard. And the remainder of those were entered by something we call um, uh, electronic file transfer, which would be large health systems, let's say like University of Michigan, would say, no, you don't have to actually do this by keyboard. Every night we're going to extract some of this stuff from our own internal systems and send it to Maker automatically. So the large health systems had the capacity to do that. So in those days, you would have this electronic file transfer. And so that's what you would see. Now look at here, in 2012, that's when Maker started accepting HL7 messages. And that's when 
the High Tech Act really start to kick in. Practices start to have their electronic health record systems required. They started using them and they started wanting to report to the registry. Well, so you start to see those messages. These dark blue slices of the stack are now HL7 messages reported to the, to the registry. And what you see is this very clear upward uh, 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 sloping um, up to about two thirds of the uh, doses now reported to uh, MICR are in fact uh, by HL7 uh, for, for kids. That's not too surprisingly, as I said, because the law in Michigan says, you know, thou shalt report. Here's the fun part, and this is the interoperability dividend. Let's look at adults. So over the exact same time period, same orientation of slide here, except now we're talking about adults, um, you know, 18 and over. You go back to 2010, this very obvious uh, increase of doses, starting out with about a million and a half-ish doses back in those days, and up to over uh, 5 million uh, today, okay? So a, a very substantial increase, but here's the fun part, right? Go back to my stack bar showing how those doses got in there. Why would, why would there be such an uptick? Well, I can tell you. If you look back in those days, just up to 200, hundreds of doses in the uh, 2010 were uh, either entered, of course, by either keyboard, somebody stood there and entered them, or else there might have been uh, an electronic transfer of files. But again, in 2012, we see this steady, steady increase, but it's really steep for adults where you have now, uh, as of last year, 85% of those doses being reported to MICR are through HL7. So like, let's just pause for a second on that. So remember, in Michigan, there is no requirement that the public health code does not require those doses to be, uh, to be reported. So but they're being reported uh, at an amazing volume and it's just growing and growing and growing and Friends, this is the reason right there, that HL7 piece, um, get my cursor to work. Um, the growth is because it's easy. Why is it easy? The preponderance of practices in Michigan are either family medicine or, or mixed uh, group practices. And so if they see kids in their practice, they have to be set up to report. They have to report to the registry. And so if they report to the registry for kids, it would be more work to not report those doses for adults. And so there's that dividend I'm talking about. We set up the systems and we basically open the, uh, a conduit that says, okay, we're connected to MICR, let's report immunization doses, <clears throat> excuse me. And so now very clearly the kids are going into the registry as required by law, but so are adults. The reason that this is so hugely important in this time of the pandemic is now, not only do we have that population denominator, I know the uh, epidemiologists on this call will love that, I use this as a denominator, um, the kids are there for sure. They're coming right out of the birth registry, but now we have the adults. I showed up at uh, you know, uh, Dexter Family Medicine and I got my flu shot. Well, I'm in the registry now. So the registry not only knows about me, but a denominator, a new guy, Kevin Domkowski, but it also knows that event that occurred. He got a flu shot. And so we now have a far more complete registry as a result of HL7. And it's not really costing those practices anything more. So I. I Really love to show that slide. Thank you, Hannah, for putting that together each and every year because it's really helpful. So as a, as a result of that interoperability, this bi-directional sharing, which is so crucial now during this pandemic, it allows us to have complete vaccination record at the point of service. Right there in your clinic where you're seeing that patient, uh, that child, we know right there via this connection to your EHR that that kid has already gotten their COVID. Okay, so we will know that at the point of service. But uh, even more so, those uh, connections will allow the return assessment uh, of that immunization, <clears throat> excuse me, information system um, uh, decision support assessment back down to an EHR. That result can be pushed back down to the uh, EHR so we can know through that complex decision support logic, is this person to date or not? That can be pushed down and the information in an uh, electronic health record system, which is native to that system in the clinical record, can also be combined with that information to say, hey, wait a minute, we got this information from the registry and it's complete and up to date. And we also know that here are our COPD or asthma patients or whatever, or who have cancer or other chronic con conditions, we can identify high-risk patients if we wish to do outreach to those high-risk groups. 
Um, and we can also use some features that are uh, native to those EHRs, which are really actually pretty sophisticated. We all know that there's portals, uh, patient portals, which are linked to the registries. There's other uh, reminder systems, whether it be text messaging, phone call <coughs> uh, messaging, or other uh, forms of messaging that are uh, built into these EHR systems. And they're actually really, really helpful. And uh, they are then further enabled by the information that's coming down from the centralized registry. Last thing I'll say, of course, is back to the vaccine inventory. We are going to then have the ability to look centrally at that information at your practice to understand what your inventory looks like. And perhaps you need to share with another one of the practices in your, uh, in your uh, health system, um, shifting from Canton to Brighton or whatever, that sort of thing. Or a health department may need to switch uh, uh, or move around some um, doses within their jurisdiction to balance things out if shortages are occurring at one end of the county versus another. So these all can be done uh, using that sort of interplay between the immunization information system and EHRs as a result of that uh, interoperability. All right, so I just want to uh, do a quick uh, uh, shout out here to uh, our, our cheer colleagues. Uh, we are very busily working on uh, interoperability in our own uh, work. Uh, for years, we've been supporting the MICA registry, looking at this HL7 messaging since the beginnings of it, actually even before the beginnings of uh, it, looking at data quality in the, the registry and um, also looking at the impacts of interoperability on provider practices in terms of their workflow, especially during this time of uh, pandemic or even just the annual flu season. Other health systems that we are, uh, health, public health systems that we support include the childhood lead poisoning prevention program, the CLIP program, which actually uses HL7 messages just like uh, we do with uh, immunization. So it's a different type of message, but the same idea uh, to report to uh, the uh, state registry, as well as uh, some new work that we're doing with newborn screening orders and uh, uh, results being sent by HL7. So the, the last portion of my uh, talk, I want to switch gears to now sort of a, uh, a, a big bigger challenge. Let's look at the national pandemic response using IAF, okay? So let's start out with one uh, element of the challenges. Okay, you probably know from watching the news or, or, or listening or seeing uh, um, news releases uh, that we clearly have uh, this big operation warp speed, you know, push to get a vaccine out for COVID. Uh, right now we have, uh, I believe, four leading contenders, two of which are on the verge, I believe, of seeking authorization uh, to uh, uh, become licensed uh, for distribution and ma manufacture and distribution. Um, those two new v vaccines are um, uh, two vaccines, uh, uh, two dose series. Uh, so in other words, you get uh, an initial dose and then 21 or 28 days later, you get a, a booster dose. So you need two in order to get the uh, complete uh, immunity. Well, two of those vaccines happen, the first two, happen to require extreme low temperature for preservation. And when I mean extreme, I'm talking about 80 degrees below zero centigrade, which is like, what, 130 degrees, something like that below zero Fahrenheit. Crazy. So th this is transportation uh, challenge, uh, unlike anything we see in vaccinations uh, or vaccines uh, in, in history, um, any... Uh, any vaccine requires at least refrigeration. So something called the cold chain is important. We're set up for that. That's uh, an important uh, feature in terms of tracking vaccines to make sure they remain refrigerated. This is different though. This is 80 below zero uh, centigrade. That is like crazy cold. And there's gonna be specialized uh, tracking and whatnot uh, to make sure that those uh, doses remain frozen at that uh, temperature uh, until uh, needed. If you want to uh, read a really interesting article, there was something in the Washington Post two days ago. Uh, just how does this all work? I, I encourage you to read that. Here's a link down here. It's really cool. So here's the challenge, and I'm going to talk about this for the remainder uh, of um, our, our time this morning. Okay, so let's say you and I were HHS, uh, the Federal uh, Health uh, Department of Health and Human Services, and or the CDC. What do we ultimately want to know about a COVID vaccine? Well, amongst several other questions, we want to know where the vaccine supplies are. Okay, where is it? How much has been administered? And like, what is our vaccination coverage for COVID nationally? That's what they're trying to do from a national perspective. So here's one big giant wrinkle. We do not have a national immunization information system. So like, how are we going to do that? 
right? I mean, it's like, like these are great questions. And as, actually, if you think about it, those three questions at a local level, state of Michigan, that's what immunization information systems can do. But guess what? We don't have a, a national IS. So now what are we going to do? Well, we don't have a national IS, but here's what we do have. We actually have 64. We have 50 states plus District of Columbia, plus five cities, which you can see uh, over here on the uh, lower right, uh, which have been delegated authority to uh, track uh, doses um, um, by their states. And then we also have eight territories, Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, Guam, American Samoa, and several other uh, smaller jurisdictions in the Pacific, uh, Micronesia, et cetera. So we have 64 different immunization information systems. That sounds pretty daunting, but here is the good news, newsflash. Uh, they all speak HL7, each and every one of them. The CDC has invested heavily over the past decade uh, to make sure that these registries, they can all be somewhat different and they can all meet the needs of their specific state, but they need to have a common framework technologically, and they do. And so this is the good news, folks, is we are well poised for this moment where these registries, if they need to exchange information, are, are actually all speaking HL7 and they're all standard. Yeah. So here's what I want to talk about for the next couple of minutes here. We've got four different strategies that the, the um, CDC has put together to uh, address the needs that they uh, believe are out there for exchanging a track of COVID-19 vaccine. And they have four different uh, angles. Uh, I'm going to walk through each of these to the best I can. But I'm going to tell you right now, my little disclaimer warning at the bottom here, this is changing rapidly and it is a little confusing, I have to admit. And part of the confusion is some of this stuff is just literally, you know, like being developed as it goes. These concepts are being changed, modified. Uh, this is all happening uh, in real time, folks. So I'll do the best I can do based on the information that we have at this point in time. Well, I share this, not to confuse you, but this is in fact what the CDC, how they envision this whole process. And I want to boil this down into terms that you and I can understand, which is what? Let's say we're Health and Human Services down here, and we want to know at Operation Warp Speed, like where the vaccines are, who's got them, and all that sort of stuff. These sort of dashboard level kind of questions for the whole country. The only way we can do that is to get information pushed down from all of those registries. And as I will explain over the next uh, few slides, it's not quite that easy, okay? The technology exists. Those standards, as I've been trying to impress upon you, exist. So the technology part is actually not that hard, actually. It's some other sort of policy and legal procedural things that uh, tend to get in the way. And so as a consequence, the CDC has built some of these layers to try to uh, address and even sort of sidestep some of those potential barriers. Let's talk about it. So first thing is this immunization gateway. This is actually an important thing that says, look, we've got all those systems out there, 64 immunization registries. We have to have some common place where they're all going to link up to so that they can use that standards-based approach between each of the uh, immunization information systems and the CDC and their systems to connect, okay? So we want to enable all of the authorized agencies to connect. So that's our goal here. So how are we going to do that? Well, that immunization gateway functions sort of like a health information exchange. Uh, maybe you've heard that term, uh, HIE, for strictly for immunization. And there's a lot of connections. If you think about it, each of those 64 jurisdictions, if you want to connect with all the remaining 63, if you go through and do the math, it, that actually turns out to be over 2,000 different connections. So building those individual connections is sort of a non-starter. So that's where the IZ gateway comes in. It actually says, no, no, don't do that. Just connect once. You connect in Michigan to the immunization gateway, we take care of the rest. The immunization gateway is sort of like a hub and it will connect it to take care of the connections to all the remaining immunization information. So that's how this is gonna work, sort of a spoken hub type of model. Here's the thing I wanna emphasize and I will probably do this three or more times before we're done here. The challenge here is not that technology. Actually, that sort of linkage I just described is actually not that challenging for the CDC to put together. It's the last bullet here, which is all the memoranda of understandings, the MOUs, the data use agreement, <clears throat> excuse me, that must uh, exist that say, on a legal perspective, the state of Michigan is authorized to share with Ohio, New Mexico, Massachusetts, New York, 
everybody. That is actually a pile of legal uh, documents and, um, and agreements. And so the immunization gateway is going to handle all of those common agreements in a centralized way. So that's a, an important function as well. So there's a technology function, but there's also a legal uh, framework function, okay? So there's another important part of this, which is it's also gonna connect other agencies that don't ordinarily connect to immunization registries. Uh, you may uh, not know that the Department of Defense, the Veterans Administration, Indian Health Service, as well as the Bureau of Prisons, uh, they administer a lot of vaccines. And we're gonna to wanna to know where those vaccine, uh, where the vaccine is in those institutions and where it's been administered in order to have that complete denominator and the com complete numerator to do our tracking nationally. So we're gonna to wanna to be able to track that, monitor that across all jurisdictions. And at some point as people travel, once we start traveling again, uh, that sort of exchange will allow uh, your information to be accessible to authorized parties uh, wherever you go. Not clear at this point in time how it will be used, but it could also be used as a foundation for proof of immunization uh, to get on an airplane or a proof of immunity. You know, I had COVID or whatever. So uh, none of that has been figured out quite yet, but those are technologically possible. Okay, so um, just a, a, a quick wrap up then on the IC gateway, I'll tell you that the legal authority though for all of this, uh, it resides with state and health departments. And so there is no federal authority. The feds cannot insist that states do this reporting and not all state law permits reporting to the same extent. So this is our important potential barrier. Uh, Rhode Island may wish to report, but their state law prohibits it. Uh, so you know, if you're like me, you might have some concerns, uh, you know, uh, regarding uh, identifiable data, which is what they're requ uh, re requesting um, it, it, to be reported to the immunization gateway uh, is uh, identifiable, meaning names and faces, Kevin Nowakowski, who lives at this address, who has this contact information. And as you can appreciate, not all people necessarily want the federal government to know where they are, okay? And I think it's safe to say that that could actually have some um, impacts on uptake of COVID vaccine uh, uh, acceptance and administration by persons who wish to not be documented. I think that you could uh, understand that scenario and other ones like that. So there's another system that I just want to quickly talk about that uh, CDC has put together to sort of sidestep some of the, the issues. There may be uh, uh, the ability for states to report to a, a, another system, which is sort of another layer they put out there, BAMS, Vaccine Administration Management System. CDC says that they uh, believe th that we need to support mass vaccination uh, in a better way that's not supported by immunization registries. And it was envisioned to, to fill that niche and also track vaccine nationally. Um, it has some other features and functions to support the needs of employers. Do all your employees have COVID vaccination, that sort of thing. And uh, going back to the summertime, CDC had said, you know what, VAM's use was gonna be mandatory. Well, uh, there's giant pushback from the states. They're going like, you know what, uh, first of all, a lot of functions in the VAM system were, were viewed as being redundant with existing immunization information system uh, uh, functionality. And they were also requesting identifiable information, which uh, as I said, uh, was not only uh, giving people some heartburn, but they also said, um, you know, uh, state law may not even permit it. Now CDC says that VAMS is optional, and uh, but it will connect with this gateway. So if you wish to uh, connect in your state, uh, if you're the state of Michigan, for example, and wish to connect in that way, it will allow uh, connection to this health exchange that I uh, described as being the immunization gateway. So <clears throat> one of the uh, primary issues though, is that this is, seems to be developed just to report up centrally to the HHS and CDC. And really the states are saying that, you know what, this is like a redundant system. Immunization registries already do this and there's really not clear uh, case yet being made and why there's a value added to providers in their practices or states in their jurisdiction. So I think the jury's still out on dams. One other system I wanna uh, uh, mention to you is this clearinghouse that they've developed. Um, they're putting together another layer that says, you know what, if you can't connect directly to the gateway with your immunization registry, and perhaps state law pro prohibits that, 
uh, or prohibits connection to the VAM system, we're going to have a place where you can just sort of upload. Um, and we're going to uh, bypass some of those connections that could, in fact, sidestep some of the legal issues for reporting uh, to, um, uh, let's say, the immunization gateway, which is this exchange. So some states may be authorized to use this clearinghouse, it's possible. Um, but it re requires identifiable information so that they can accurately deduplicate people. You know, you got to know all the instances of Kevin Dombrowski or even Kevin Dombrowski so you can actually say, hey, that's the same guy and get the, those sorts of um, instances reconciled. Well, a lot of states are either having heartburn, as I say, or are flat out prohibited for, uh, from re reporting identifiable data. And uh, so that is actually um, continuing to be a challenge. They say, though, from the clearinghouse, once they do all that, they're going to de identify it and then report it up to this last step, which is sort of, in my words, the um, uh, sort of the dashboard system. They call it the data lake. I don't know how they come up with these great terms. But it's basically de-identified information that, that comes from all those systems. It's a cloud-hosted system that put, basically pulls in all of that de-identified data from all those different reporting options, consolidates it, deduplicates it. And the bottom line is, is this is what they're trying to do. Is they're trying to serve health and human services needs for sort of a dashboard, operation warp speed, you know, so we can say, okay, where's all the vaccine at? Who's gotten it? Those sorts of things at that level. So. Uh, in my mind, that's the primary purpose for all these different layers being pushed up. I will say, and I'll just remind you, you know, public health occurs at the local and even state level in primary care. It's not happening at the White House. Okay, I'm just going to say that. Okay, it's happening boots on the ground. And so those systems that I described earlier, immunization, image formation systems, and those linkages to EHR, that's where the action's at. So, um, I will say that there are some issues that remain, uh, the extent to which those uh, that states will or even uh, be able to participate in uh, sharing data at that level nationally remains to be seen. Uh, how we use that information to document vaccination status for our, our ability to uh, show up for work, uh, to travel, um, all that is yet to be figured out. And how they aggregate that data into that dashboard remains to be seen. I just want to say one more thing before we finish up here. You know, I talk about the state to state uh, variations because state law varies. The Constitution of the United States, States says that that authority resides with the states. So Ohio can do what they want to do, Michigan can do what we want to do, Texas can do what they want to do. Well, there's variations in those laws, and those affect what goes into those immunization registries. Some states authorize different age groups. Some are opt in, Texas. Some are opt out, Michigan. Actually, most of them are opt out, which says, like, okay, you're in the registry unless you check the little box and say, no, I don't want my baby in the Medicare registry. Okay. And those have big implications for complete participation, as you can imagine. And likewise, who reports? Public providers, private providers, do pharmacies report, schools, universities, all those different things are controlled by state law. Okay. So, my little analogy is my last bullet is this. So you can take all these, you know, technological gymnastics and put all this information together, but what do you really have? And I, I'm not sure that anybody knows the answer to this. I just want to say that in my analogy, you could use the Swiss cheese analogy and say, sure, there might be some solid pieces if you go across all those 64 different jurisdictions that you just stacked information for, but there's probably going to be some holes in there. So, you know, and so even in Michigan, where we have good reporting for adults, we don't have complete reporting. We have very good reporting because it's not, it's not mandatory by law. So when you aggregate all that up, you know, it still uh, remains to be seen just how solid uh, that stack of Swiss cheese is going to be. Okay? Lots of pushback on some of these ideas. I, I point you to a reference here. Uh, some of our good friends, Association of Immunization Managers, American Immunization Registry Association, and others, these agencies, or these organizations rather, are representing the boots on the ground folks who take care of immunizations and public health. They are saying, you know what, this, uh, this model that is being presented by the CDC is not ready for prime time. Um, there's a lot of prohibitions at state law level, as I've mentioned, and how that flow is going to recur, uh, occur uh, is not clear at all. And mainly, some of this has been tested. Some of the stuff is just being developed as we speak. None of it's been tested. And guess what? We have a pandemic right now, not, not next year, right now. 
So there's some real concerns. And so that is still being worked out. I leave you with some uh, references here. And I, I guess my, my closing remarks will be this, even though this last uh, segment here about um, national pandemic response, you go like, gee, what the heck's happening in, uh, with all these different layers and it's a little confusing. And I just got done telling you that, is it gonna be incomplete? What I wanna do is point you back to the earlier part of this, which says, you know what? Our immunization information systems and their ability to speak with primary care electronic health record systems is solid. It's very, very good. And we are well poised to meet the needs uh, and the demands of this pandemic at the level at which the public health response occurs. Right here, you know, boots on the ground in clinics and at uh, in mass vaccination clinics or in, in uh, you know, uh, individual clinics. But we are well poised to track that information. How that gets bubbled up at a national level, some of that has yet to be determined. And that's really where some of the question is. So, um, I do want to thank uh, my many collaborators, uh, primarily uh, Ann Cowan, Anna Peng, and Pooja Patel, who provide lots of information along the way, which I've uh, incorporated into this, or the, some of the projects that I have referenced here. And I think that uh, we have uh, time for other questions. Uh, if there question. are any, if you can go. Ahead. I'm sorry? Um, Gary has a question. If you, if you want to go ahead. Gary, yes. Hey, Kevin, thanks so much. This was fascinating. Can shout it out. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Gary. Okay, great. So um, thanks so much for this. This was really fascinating. Um, my question stems from, I'm on the task force at U of M that's gonna be rolling out the vaccine that we receive and how we're gonna do it to you know, healthcare providers and then how that rolls out ultimately to patients in other places. And the question of, that is come up a lot is the issue obviously of mass vaccination yeah. and how or whether those things make it into Micker, how they make it into Micker. And you know that's everything from drive-through clinics to you know whatever it might be. And I was wondering what the experience has been with that with something we already have like flu vaccine. You know, like if there's a thing at, you know, Target for all their employees, for their adults. Does any of that end up in Micker? And if someone does a drive-through exactly. thing, what, you know, the, we're not set up to do drive-through and have little computers out there that track it, even though we probably should. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I agree. Uh, so, um, the capacity of a registry such as Micker, um, they do capture that, uh, Gary. Uh, there has been uh, actually um, a lot of drive up vaccination going on since the onset of COVID, not for delivery of COVID vaccine, obviously, but for regular, you know, primary vaccination series uh, of vaccinations. And a lot of practices across the state have already adopted sort of this drive up service. Uh, and um, basically it's the roll up your sleeve or your kid's sleeve. Uh, and they actually do take laptops out in the parking lot. They have little tents set up and all that sort of thing. There are models for that, and I can actually point you to uh, uh, some practices, and some of them are not tiny. Some practices are doing this, and it's working well. Um, and so I mean, not, I, not practices, but like in the private sector, let's say that um, Alterum does a vaccine thing for a flu vaccine for all of their employees. Not a practice, yeah. but a. Okay. So uh, that would be more likely um, like the, you know, visiting nurses, that sort of thing. Um, and so uh, those doses do end up typically in Micker, like for flu clinics like that. They don't necessarily happen real time, like, you know, a millisecond later, but they, they generally show up, let's say, in batches at the end of the day or end of the week. I, I hope that answered your question, Gary. Yeah, thanks. I, I think the challenge with COVID is just at the scale and the time frame is I um, daunting. I, I agree. And I think that, uh, as you point out, uh, seasonal influenza is sort of our best model to emulate uh, because that's obviously something that tends to be like very concentrated and on large scale. But um, I think it's safe to say that some of this we're figuring out as we go. But there are some models for that, Gary. Thank you.
And if others happen to have questions, uh, you know, after the time, I think we are running out of time, uh, please feel free to email me. I, and I don't pretend to have all the answers because like I said, there's a lot of this is just being developed as we go. But, um, you know, I, I can try to point you to, uh, to resources, but I would encourage you to, to uh, click on that link at your leisure and look at that Washington Post uh, article that talks about just sort of the vaccine um, process. Uh, which, by the way, the uh, Pfizer uh, vaccine is being manufactured uh, in Kalamazoo, Michigan, actually Portage, Michigan. But uh, so, uh, you know, it has a really, really interesting article there about how that uh, process uh, works and, and inventory and whatnot. I encourage you to read it. Thanks, um, Kevin. This was an awesome talk and um, very timely <laughs> and informative right now. So um, I really appreciate it. And it looks like um, Dan put the link to the article in the chat um, so people you, can Dan. copy it. Um, Great. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much. Well, thank you all for joining and um, enjoy uh, spring. I guess it's supposed to be warm there. So uh, 